want me to get started? Yes. <laughs> Okay, I, it's odd that we have three people over here. Would you like us to go around and do introductions? Yeah, that would be helpful. Does that feel good? Why don't you introduce yourself and then we'll... I'm Rusty Bott. No. <laughs> I'm Rob Cox. I work downstairs. Uh, this is the only time I can actually say downstairs. <laughs> Rusty Bott. Does, do people mind getting filmed at all? Oh, this, is, this is going to go on the Sneak website and stuff like that. Okay, great. <laughs> Tucker Rasmus, volunteer Rasmus Books, Northampton. Same, Lynn Rasmus. Great. Stephen Wiggins, Five Books, Shelburne. Steve Finer, Greenfield. Eddie Ann Sharp, Barely Read Books, Sudbury, Massachusetts. Peter Macy, Peter Macy, Books, Montague, Massachusetts. Barbara Smith, Barbara Smith, Books and Paper, and Lake of the Waitley Book Center, now closed. John Riley, Gabriel Books in Northampton. It's great to put names to places. <laughs> well, uh, I, I want to keep it short up here to tell you what we do here. And if you've got questions, go ahead and ask me anytime. Uh, I am here. I live here, pretty much. Uh, we know the time. Yeah, <laughs> sadly, sadly, sadly. I'm underpaid. I'm, no, uh, that's not so why we're here. A bookseller. Uh, so, yeah. so our, uh, our collection here, I've been here at UMass since 2004, and we have pretty much remade the, the department during that time. Uh, we've gone from four people in the department to nine as of now, uh, so that's a good sign. We've gone from, we thought, maybe uh, 15,000, 16,000 linear feet of material to over 42,000 linear feet of material uh, at last count from 20,000 books to somewhere pushing toward 40 at this point. Books are kind of the uh, uh, little bit of our uh, weak sister here in the department here. But we look at everything as being integrated. So manuscripts, books, archival materials, photographs, and other sort of things are all sort of thrown together. Uh, the one thing we really don't do much of is maps. <laughs> So you won't hear me saying anything much about maps. We get the occasional map in, um, some very nice maps that occasionally come in with other collections, but we don't usually seek out maps for the most part. It's just uh, because we're so weak in maps, and we have, we're so poor, so poor, uh, so very poor, that uh, I, can't, uh, I can't hope to collect the maps. But what we do is we focus on, you know, other than UMass, which no one really cares about. We do three different areas where we collect. Uh, we collect in histories and cultures of New England. Uh, there, it's, it's fairly broad. We do everything from literary culture to industry, politics. We have a couple of congressmen, a, a former governor, a lot of state reps in the, in the collections here. So politics <laughs> is important. The uh, industrial history, we, we've selected mostly in Western Mass, and we have fairly large collections relating to corporations of various sorts. Uh, the cutlery industry up and down the upper Connecticut River Valley, in Massachusetts, the upper part in Massachusetts, is one of the little sub-areas that we've developed, textiles and so forth. Nothing terribly exciting there. We do a lot of family collections as well. Uh, that's an area that we're hoping to grow in. Secondly, we do innovation and entrepreneurship. I was just saying that we do uh, that area of collection started with the papers of Mark McCormick. And if we were two floors below us right now, McCormick papers would start at that wall and go almost all the way to the wall that you can't see behind you. It's uh, a large enough collection that when I first started talking to the McCormick family who were trying to place the collection, I said, how large is the collection? And they said, oh, it's large. So what does large mean to you? And does it mean 100 boxes, 500 boxes? Well, it's probably on 500 boxes. It could be more. Good. Called them back, and the next time they talked, and they said, well, it's, it's pretty clearly more than 500. <laughs> How much more? I, it's, it's more. And uh, that way, we sort of sat in this uh, Never Never Land for a little while until I went out to Cleveland to see it. And they took me down to right below McCormick's office, a little room they had set aside as archives. And I looked around, and I said, 150 boxes in here, it's not much. So, oh, no, no, go around the corner. Maybe 300, 400 boxes in that corner. So we had maybe four or 500 boxes between the two. And I said, that's not that bad. I said, oh, no, most of it's over in the warehouse. <laughs> so we went to the warehouse, walked in. There's a room about this size, actually, filled with video and audio. 
And I said, hey, this is great. He said, no, you're not getting this. This is, <laughs> yeah, this is not part of it. This is, you know, we're keeping this for, for business purposes. Right. Rob, who is Mark McCormick? I'm sorry. This Mark is McCormick is. is the founder of IMG, which is the International Marketing Group, which is uh, one of the world's largest marketing corporations, especially in sport and entertainment in the world. His first three clients were Arnold Palmer, Gary Player, and Jack Nicklaus. And uh, he ran that company up into something like 70, com uh, 70 countries around the world now, and I don't know how many employees, but thousands of employees. Mm -hmm. So it's a large corporation. It's been around for about 55 years now, 57 years now, something like that. But McCormick, uh, uh, when I got to the next room, it was you know, filled. It was double the size of this, all the way to the ceiling boxes. And, no, these are just Mark's books, extra copies. So where, where are the archives? Whoa. And we turned the corner, and it was like Raiders of the Lost Ark, as far as you can see. <laughs> Stacked this way, this way, up to the ceiling with boxes. There were 54,000 boxes. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> a little more than 500. <laughs> Slightly more. Their, their ability to estimate at, at yeah, IMG is not strong. Uh, yeah, and then they said, oh, there are other offices, too. So, thank you. So 54,000 boxes. We have only about 2,500 downstairs. It might be a few wow. more than that. Uh, we have another couple hundred from the other stakeholder at IMG, a guy named uh, Jay Lafave. But that collection is huge. It started us off on this jag of doing innovation entrepreneurship, looking for people, particularly in social innovation, uh, social entrepreneurship, people who um, have novel approaches to their lines of inquiry, their lines of work. The area that we collect most intensively, and I, I brought out some of our propaganda here that you can pass around. This is unfortunately this is uh, the most recent issue of our library newsletter, which is not done by me, so please don't complain. Uh, followed by our annual report and a little tiny pamphlet on the third area that we collect and the area that we collect most intensively, which is social change. Um, social change began a number of years ago when, uh, 1973, when the papers of W.B. Du Bois arrived here. Uh, du Bois was a great civil rights leader and a uh, very important figure in African American history from his birth in 1868 to his death in 1963. And Du Bois' collection is complete and entire uh, here, as much as there is of Du Bois anywhere, almost all of it is here. There's little clutches in a couple of other locations, but almost all of it is here. So Du Bois was a rock for us, and when I arrived here, uh, knowing that we had no money, which is in fact why I came here, uh, believe it or not, uh, it is one of the motives for coming here. There's lack of money. I, I'm, not, I'm not smart. Uh, but, um, but I came here, uh, Du Bois, we wanted to build on Du Bois, we wanted to think about how to add to that Du Bois legacy. And recognize that because we have no funds, that adding in African American history is difficult, uh, not impossible, but quite difficult started rethinking how we organize our collections and realized that you know, Du Bois was not simply a figure in African American history. He was a person who was deeply involved in thinking about how to change society for the better. And he recognized, among other things, that to change, uh, to achieve any sort of racial justice in the country relied upon the ability to achieve economic justice, justice with respect to gender, uh, to, uh, he was an anti-imperialist, he was a peace leader as well. And so we shifted our focus from thinking about individual movements like racial justice and thinking more co coherently about looking at connections between and among movements. And that's been our focus since then. And we have developed very, very large collections downstairs where we will talk to an activist who's known primarily for one area, but discover very quickly that they're involved in other areas of social justice struggle because they don't see peace being separate from the environment or the environment being separate from race or race being separate from gender. And they all do it in various different ways, but as a result, we've developed tremendous strength in disability rights, uh, environmental justice, uh, anti-nuclear movement, communal living, um, and I could go on and on. There's a, a, quite a number of them. Uh, those collections have really swelled quite a bit. Most of the growth that we've had in our collections has been in the area of social change, social justice. And we tend to work with uh, whole communities at a time. Rather than talking to one person, we try to talk to a, a network of people as best we can. So that's pretty much what we've done. Uh, the things that have come in recently here on that uh, piece of propaganda from the library as a whole, 
You'll see the front image cover there is from the New England Yearly Meeting of Friends. Their records arrived here about a year ago, almost exactly, uh, 350 years of uh, manuscript stuff and uh, something like 3,000 books relating to Quakers in New England. And uh, as, a, as a good Quaker and a sometime Quaker historian, that's a, a very nice thing indeed. And we've been mining that stuff since it's been here, but I, I could go on and on about the number of collections that have come here from former presidents of SDS to uh, most recently actually a convicted terrorist, uh, is what he's called, to uh, peace, peaceniks like the, uh, the Quakers. Uh, so we, we cover quite a broad terrain there. And the collections are pretty actively used. The other thing that I would mention here is that we are working very actively in digitization. And uh, our first collection to digitize was the papers of W.E.B. Du Bois. Every scrap of paper has been done at item level. And we've built since then, and we are continuing to build at a very rapid rate. Uh, we were recently, our, our collections were absorbed into what they call Digital Commonwealth, which is a, an aggregator of digital collections in New England, and then into Digital Public Library of America, which is an aggregator of digital collections at the national level. And even though we're poor and small in a lot of ways, we're the biggest contributor to Digital Commonwealth. And in fact, when we went in, we, we were about 50% of Digital Commonwealth. That's how big we've grown. And we're in the top 15 contributors to the Digital Public Library of America right now. So we're, we're pretty good there. We continue to try to keep the pressure on the people downstairs, grind them into <laughs> dust uh, to produce more content. But we look at this dance between the digital and the original as being what we're in for now. Uh, one doesn't preclude the other. Uh, I do, in fact, have a, an online exhibit that I'm calling a virtual exhibit of things that can't be exhibited virtually. Uh, because I, I strongly believe there's a lot of things that you can digitize, but you lose the meaning, and things that really can't be digitized meaningfully in the first place. Uh, but we, we try to balance the both, and we try to uh, proceed as, as rapidly as we can in uh, developing our archives uh, across the board, both digitally and in terms of physical legacy materials. Uh, the most recent area that I've been very uh, glad to dive into has been in photographer's archives, photojournalists, and so forth, particularly ones who involved in social change movements, and we brought in a fair number of uh, pretty substantial photographic archives in the last two or three years, four or five years maybe, uh, and they're growing very rapidly. Uh, most um, important of which, the best known of which, is Peter Simon, who's Carly Simon's brother and the son of Simon and Schuster Simon. And uh, Peter is an excellent photographer, uh, began at BU, went through a phase where he was living in communes, did a lot of music, a lot of everything under the sun. And uh, Peter's stuff is downstairs, and we're actively digitizing it as we go. We have about two, 3,000 images into what looked like maybe 100,000, 50,000 to 100,000 images over his career. Hard to know exactly how many it's going to be since we haven't seen the whole beast yet. Uh, but that's what it's like to work here. Uh, if you've got questions, I, I will let you get to your work, or you can ask questions either way. Would you, uh, did, did, weren't you at APS for a while? I was. I, I was at University of Michigan uh, when, I, when I met Rusty the first time uh, and uh, worked at the William Clements Library there. I am an early American historian, partly thanks to working at the Clements. Uh, they, I blame them. Uh, but Clements was a great place to work. Uh, many of you know John Dan, I know. Uh, the drunken sailor, John Dan. And, uh, and that, was, that, that was a great place to learn. And then I went to the American Philosophical Society where we did predominantly uh, history of science, and especially uh, contemporary history of science, genetics, quantum physics, a few other areas, anthropology, cultural anthropology, ethnography. So my question actually is because it relates to here. You said it came knowing they had no money. That's not the case the other two places. And, you know, right. and not much collection is not the case here. So all of that through you here? Or? Yeah, I, I, I came here, you know, at Michigan, it's, it's an environment where we had money and we had depth of collections that was to, to die for. At APS, we had depth of collections and even more money. And uh, I, I thought it'd be more interesting to work in a place that didn't have that. I just thought it'd be a, an interesting challenge. Because my father was offered the job as an assistant in Randy Adams at $3,000 a year. Is that right? He turned it down because he thought it'd be more interesting to be a bookseller. Well, almost everyone would agree, but uh, <laughs> yeah. 
You know, it was more money than he was making. Too. Anybody on this side of the fence would say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But yeah, Clemens didn't pay well. I can tell you that. Uh, that was insultingly low pay. But that, it was it was fine. They may have adjusted it since then. I I, didn't, I never cared. It never it mattered to me what I was making. Uh, and in fact, I've uh, both jumps when I met, went from Clemens to APS. And I went from APS here. They asked how much I earned. I gave them a figure which was wrong. And I actually took a pay cut. And they were trying to give me a pay raise to come to places, but that's because I don't pay much attention to that mm -hmm. stuff, Good. Uh, unfortunately. So your advantage in uh, digitizing material, is that because of the availability of student help? Partly. Uh, I think it's, there's a number of, number of reasons we're able to go fairly quickly, and it's because, uh, as my mother said, if you lower your standards enough, you'll never be disappointed. But, no, I, it, the way... Uh, the way I look at it is it, it, digitization is just a process. It's, it's nothing more than that. And rather than fetishize the process, we just do it. And people will do planning and do all sorts of things. And we do that as well. We do that in, in place. But really, it's, it's a fairly repetitive thing. It's like glorified Xeroxing. Uh, some of it takes a little bit more skill than, than just Xeroxing. But to be honest, you can, you can get into a mode where you have your systems and your people in place to absorb things in a fairly efficient way, and that's what we try to do. It's just feed it into the system and keep moving along. We don't wait for grants. Uh, we don't. Well, I mean, we have we've gotten a number of grants, but we don't wait for them. We just plunge ahead and doing a little bit here and there as we go along is part of what we do. Is sharing it among the staff and what I call the many ants one hill model. Uh, we uh, are able to carry a lot of sugar up to the top of the hill. And it's worked well for us. I, I imagine uh, for places that are better healed or who have larger staffs or uh, who have other things they could do even faster, but they don't seem to be doing it for the most part. So, do you have any any evidence about the effect on research? I mean, is more more research being done digitally, and that I mean that means that a lot fewer people are coming here. No, it, it doesn't turn out to be that. That's so. Ten years ago, that's what everyone would have said was the more we digitize, the fewer people will come. It, I first started seeing that switch back, I was still at the APS or whatever it was before 04. We had somebody from MIT Press come out and was talking about digitizing books and building them up. And her opinion was, she said we had some empirical evidence, it wasn't firm at that point, but her opinion was digitizing a book and putting it online actually sold more copies mm -hmm. because of the greater exposure than you would sell otherwise. And what we find is that we have a ton more use of collections like Du Bois or our other collections that are up there than we ever would have had before because there are people in Asia or in Africa or in Europe or South America seeing our material when they never would have done before. Some of those will come here, very few from that distance, but people who are closer will often come here. So our numbers have our numbers of in-person visitors has increased for every year for six or six or seven years in a row, and that's all I've really tracked. I haven't bothered to go much further back than that. Uh, our numbers this year, I know for January through May, January through April, pardon me, were the highest ever recorded for that month in in the, the history of this department, and May was tied, I think it was, with the highest month. So the numbers are rising in terms of on, feet on the ground, and the digital use is astronomically higher than it was. So I'm, I, I can't say I'm optimistic. All I really care about is job security until I retire. <laughs> uh, but it, I'm not unoptimistic about the prospects for whoever succeeds me, uh, maintaining and keeping it going. But the reality is we simply do not have a choice anymore. If you're not digitized at a, a fairly high level, if you're not out there digitally, you don't exist. Mm -hmm. And uh, the institutions who've held off from digitiz digitizing are losing out. And there are some elite institutions who have held off for, for a long time because they can. Uh, but there are a lot of other institutions that have made a strategic decision to either go very partially or slowly into digitization. And unfortunately, I think they're the ones who are going to take it on the chin as we go forward. Rob, well, you say, though, everything you digitize, you still have the physical object. Always. Yeah. Okay. Always. Unlike, I mean, wasn't it some places have, uh, yeah. Well, you know, back in the 30s, when, when microfilming started, uh -huh. 
there was a period of probably five to ten years when a lot of archives said, if we microfilm, it's distribution, everybody will love it, and we can get rid of these originals and not have to worry about it. And that, that proved to be a pretty foolish choice then. Um, and it, you know, getting rid of any originals uh, would be a pretty foolish choice now. Once you digitize something, do you just forget about it and say, let the Digital Library of America or Commonwealth worry about refreshing it and taking care of it? That's a, it's a good, that's an excellent question. We, the way I look at a DPLA or, or Digital Commonwealth, those are these big things out there. They're the Walmarts of the digital world. They have a lot of stuff. They're not particularly good at what they do. Some of the stuff is very low quality. But you can go in and hit a large market. Uh, that, to me, puts the burden on us to maintain our own digital repository and have it fine-tuned for what we do and who we, who we see. So putting it out there in DPLA is good for access at one level, but to me, it just turns it back on us to say we have that much stronger a, a need to do what we do better. And how often do you have to refresh, or whatever the word is? You know. Yeah, the, uh, it varies widely. And what I would say is that the backbone of our digital environment right now is pretty. It relies on a series of very stable standards. So TIFFs, we produce JPEGs, we a variety of other things that we ingest that could go into the audio and visual formats. It doesn't matter. But we rely on a set number of those. Those have been stable for a number of years, and I anticipate they'll be stable for a number of years more. Um, if the time comes that the TIFF becomes outmoded, we decide to go into JPEG 2000 or some other new standard, that's not one we would probably go into. But some new standard, it's a fairly simple thing to do. It's a lot of computational crunch that you have to you know, apply. But it's not that hard to put everything that has a tag JPEG, uh, TIFF on it and just run it through and spit out whatever comes to succeed it. Uh, if I have a concern, it's more in the video or the audio. Uh, more in the video, really, not even the audio, but the video. Uh, because video formats are not as stable, I think, although they're getting there. So do you have, like, a large, like, source file, and then you draw from this, and then if you, uh, for, like, if you, if there is a new standard coming, then you would draw from this? That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. What we, what we try to do is if we scan something, if we digitize something, we do it at a high rate, a high resolution, the highest quality we can, uncompressed. And that copy goes and sits into a, a digital preservation system, and we can call up things to generate any number of daughters. When you go onto our site, you don't actually see that master file. You can get to it if you, if you really needed to. What you see are the derivatives that come off it that are smaller and more fluid on the internet. You know, they'll, they'll move faster with narrow bandwidth. Uh, I used to live in New Salem, and no one in their right mind lives in New Salem. We, we don't have high-speed internet there, mm. but I can sit at home with my phone and look at things. Um, so it, it works well enough that I, I can do that. Could I ask you a personal question? How, how did you become interested in the history of food? Food. I eat. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, I exist. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was a opportunity, I think. I had a student here who was finishing up his senior year looking for a project, and uh, he liked to cook. And he didn't know what to do for his project, and so we set up an uh, independent study for him where he decided that uh, we would make use of the cookbook collections here. And we have upside of twelve to 13,000 cookbooks here, mostly these community cookbooks, the church cookbooks mm -hmm. and so forth, New England cookbooks more generally. And uh, we said, you know, go play. And he came up with the idea, either he or I came up with the idea, I think probably him, uh, of doing a, what we ended up calling a compendium of chowder and doing an online site where we take every chowder recipe we possibly could <laughs> and throw it in one place. And a publisher saw it and said, do you want to do a book? And he said, well, I don't write. And I said, I write. He said, I cook. I don't cook, so it was a good pairing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wrote, he cooked, he took the photos, he's a good photographer. And uh, during that, I said, well, if I do one book, why don't we do three? And the publisher said, oh, okay. What's the third one? Uh, the third one is pie. Uh, well, then what's the second one? The second one is cranberry. So okay. I, I, knew, I knew I wanted to write about cranberries. Mm -hmm. uh, why? Uh, the uh, labor issues uh, in the cranberry industry and the 
uh, ecological impact, the environmental history of cranberries in Massachusetts were interesting to me. Uh, and I, I knew a little bit about that. I don't know why. Uh, I thought I was going to do maple as the third one, but it turned out that maple was not good timing for the publisher. <laughs> they had done one on maples in northern, northern New England and didn't need two maple books in New England, so all right. Hold it pot. <laughs> What's the publisher? Uh, History Press. Yeah. Yeah, they're a popular thing. You know, it's not scholarly. My first two books were in the scholarly end. These ones these are not. So. What were your other two books? Uh, the first book was on history of American spiritualist movement, and uh, that's what I collect myself, as some people know. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I have a, a nice collection, predominantly 19th century American spiritualism. I do a little bit of British and American, but that book was on spiritualist movement from 1848 to 1870s or so. And, uh, and then I did one on the plants of Lewis and Clark, uh, a, a book that was an edited volume for the bicentennial of Lewis and Clark, in which I worked on plants of Lewis and Clark. How did the library get so many cookbooks? Uh, gift. You one, know? one big gift? Uh, uh, there's one serious donor who donates all the damn time. Wow. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had many other calls. And I, I can tell you, and you probably already know this, I'm talking to an audience who knows this, but no one collects one cookbook, uh, as it turns out. Uh, I remember getting a call from a woman down in Springfield. She said, I got a lot of cookbooks. She, yeah, you want to donate? Yeah, I want to donate. So we, we, she said, how many? She said, bring a truck. So we, we drove down with a truck and a car and got there. And we went into her house, and there was nothing to see. And, she, and there were like all these boxes on the floor. And I said, are you boxing for us? No, no, those are not for you. Go through the house, room after room after room. There's like five cookbooks here, two over there, one over here. Nothing. Then she takes us to the attic, of course, wow. which is 150 degrees. <laughs> and books were double and triple stacked on the wow. shelves up there. We got them into the van. There were so many that the van couldn't drive. It was too weighed down. So we had to offload to get them back in. Uh, and that's typical of cookbooks. And I've tried to get our primary donor, and there's, there's probably a dozen regular donors to our cookbooks. I've tried to get our primary donor to focus strictly on New England. Uh, and it's hard. Uh, but we do community cookbooks, we do New England, the commercial cookbooks, anything published in or by a New England author on New England cuisine. And we do what I call corporate cookbooks, which, you know, Peter, you have a lot of at different times, the things that are put out by Jell-O or uh, Spry Shortening or Banana Industry to sell more product. And I love them for the graphics. I love them for the cultural history that lie in them. And those are my favorites. Um, and we get a lot of them. I mean, if you just stand there and say you cook, collect cookbooks, they start coming in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you do with duplicates, Rob? <laughs> what do I do with them? No, that's a bookseller's question. Yeah. Yeah, what do you do with duplicates? Uh, yeah, with, with dupes, we, we do what we can with the dupes. It's often difficult because of the size of the collections and the rate of growth to know when we have a dupe. Oh, okay. uh, so we we often out. know, but we don't always know. And so what we'll do is sort of set them aside, and at some point we'll make a decision on what to do with them. And as a state institution, if we've accessioned them, it's a little harder to get rid of them. Oh, really? Yeah, in theory, we can't. Um, in theory. But I'm hoping that there's going to be an exception. Uh, like I said, job security is my job number one, so I'm looking very slowly at how to get rid of them. But uh, I would love to move, yeah. you know, 500 or 1,000 of these things out if we could do. And uh, they're, they're good books, you know, but we don't need three copies of the Amherst Women's Club. Right. Uh, we really mm -hmm. don't. We do need one. How do you do um, the space management? Uh, because, I mean, you know, how, how much are you full here? So, I Do you get another collection of what you said, 54,000 boxes? Mm -hmm. If you get another of those, those collections, could you actually. I, I am a space take imperialist. Yeah? I, there's no doubt I, I, I am a space imperialist. If there's space, I will take it. <laughs> we are the ideal gas of the library. We will expand to fill any volume. Uh, do you go down? Do you go down a ways? I go down anywhere. Anywhere I can go. No, does the library? Yeah. 
the, the library, we have a basement. So when I arrived here, we had some storage on 25. You can see it's mostly offices. A little bit of storage, this area right behind there, and a part of floor 24. Since that time, we've taken over a large area of compact shelving in the basement, all of floor 24. We have space over the next building, and up until recently, we were on the space plans for taking over all of floor 23, and I desperately, desperately need that space. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm getting to the point now where I'm feeling, you know, choked. Mm -hmm. And I would like that 23 right now. Uh, the good thing, if you want to call it that, is the library is in the process of moving any book that's been digitized off-site mm -hmm. because those books in the general library collection are not used. Students in preference, they will use only the things online. They will only be using books in physical form if forced to do so. So the, li the rest of the library is sort of moving things out and we're trying to maintain. Uh, the difficulty is that when you have a 26-story building sitting in the middle of a campus where space is an issue for everyone, everyone else wants a piece of this pie, so mm -hmm. to speak. So we've given over whole floors to other units. Mm -hmm. They've taken over areas for us. So there's this constant battle for space. And uh, we'll see if I win or lose mm -hmm. on, on floor 23, but uh, you know, I better win. Do you have everything here? Do you have top premises? My, my goal has been with, and I would defend this until I retire, uh, any special collection needs to have everything within hailing distance. Mm -hmm. Because if I sent McCormick off site and someone came in to use McCormick, how am I going to handle getting 500 boxes from storage or 2,000 boxes mm -hmm. from storage if that's what they want to do? So we either need a massive swing space here for calling things off a site, or we need to have things within hailing distance. And right now, the, the stuff next door, the, in the next building over, is off site in a limited sense. But we can get it in 10 minutes or 15. And I think that's okay. We, do, we did get to the point about a year ago where we sent a few hundred feet of material off site into deep storage. Mm -hmm. But we were able to take things that were closed to the public for a variety of reasons, or things that were, for other reasons, never going to be used. And so we haven't had to confront the issue of sending off something that we think is potentially useful. And I swear, as soon as, as, soon as we made a decision that no one is ever going to use the George C. Gilbert Company records, within a week, we would have a, a, a question, a query for it. It, it happens. It's inevitable. It's, it's, um, it's this karmic thing that happens, uh, and I, I know it happens. Uh, so we haven't had to face that yet, but uh, you know, at some point we'll see. We've, we switched directors about a year ago, uh, a year ago in August, and the old director was very uh, amenable to finding additional space for us. And it would have been very easy, and I know in most places if I'd come and said, uh, you know, we've got 2,500 boxes to receive this, uh, if we had to find space for 2,500 boxes, most of the places would have said no. But we were lucky that we had the right timing and the right director at that point. And right now, it's a different environment. We have to see what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. so. uh, I'm interested in the social movements collections mm -hmm. and how you're pursuing the current uh, rather vigorous activity mm -hmm. in that area, especially with a good deal of it uh, social media. Yeah, we. Uh, I've been. I. As a historian, I've always said my eyes glaze over after 1900. Because mm -hmm. uh, I, I really, you know, I did my dissertation on spiritual because I didn't want to talk to anybody who was living <laughs> in, doing my, in doing history. And, uh, and I had done because they were 19th century dead people. And uh, so I went on both counts. With current stuff, we do work with some contemporary movements, I mean literally contemporary movements. Uh, most of what we deal with are people who are at the end of their activist career. And so it's, it's not the same issue with dealing with things like social media. Uh, electronic files are a big part of it, and those are fairly easy to harvest. When you get to things like Twitter accounts and so forth, we have not really gotten into trying to capture that too, too much. Um, that'll come, and there are ways to harvest that information. But the digital stuff, fairly easy. When you get to the social media, a little harder. 
and we have a natural lag, and then we're not dealing with you know, Black Lives Matter, we would be happy to document Black Lives Matter, but, but Black Lives Matter right now so much is on social media and only on social media that it would take a different collection strategy than we're currently pursuing. But we're dealing with people like Carl Oglesby, who's uh, president of Students for Democratic Society in 64, 65. Carl was in Cambridge. We talked him into sending his collection here. Carl moved to Amherst with his collection. Uh, and, uh, you know, he was at the end of a long career, and so things came with him, it's a little easier. There were some electronic things, I think, that Carl worked on very late in his career, but not much. Uh, Harvey Wasserman has been an anti-nuclear, off-energy guy. Harvey was out here last week, and his stuff just came here. Harvey's all over in Facebook and other sorts of online systems, and we're collecting that through Harvey. He produces them all online, and then puts it out, so we collect it through Harvey. But it's a, more of a challenge if you're dealing with a distributed group who are using social media as their primary means of, con of, of connection. We're, we haven't done that yet. Uh, we do have a guy who's right there, uh, who uh, is our digital guy. And if, if we got to the point where we wanted to do that, I would point to him. And within an hour or two, we'd have a solution for us. But it's, it's not easy. It's a different way of thinking about collecting. Rob. I don't know, do you do anything, or I'm thinking even maybe the Smithsonian was, all these signs and things that are coming out of these amazing marches. Yeah. Um, is there people who are starting to collect these or photographs of them or something? We, we do. The richest? We do. We're not, I wouldn't say we're not a museum. Right. So I don't go after that as my primary mode. But we have Madeleine Albright's head downstairs. Uh, we have you know, giant posters and banners yeah. and all sorts of things. And it's, it's a part of the way people communicate. One of the questions, oddly enough, with the people that we work with a lot is, do you take t-shirts? You know, you, you would think t-shirts, but t-shirts are very important to them for, yeah. for whatever reason. And so, yeah, we do t-shirts. And uh, those sort of smaller things are easy to do, no problem. If somebody wanted to come and say, you know, Bread and Puppet Theater, we've got you know, 18 foot tall puppets, uh, do you want them? We would it's more museum. We would talk about it, we would probably take one or two as an example, but we would look to see whether there's a better solution for the long term preservation of those, and that would more likely be the museum environment. But again, I, I think you, know, you guys would probably already have this bias, but to me there's, the distinction between a museum and archive at a library is, is very real and also very artificial at the same time. Uh, archivists, manuscript people don't do things the same way. We don't do the th same thing the way library people do, and we don't do the same thing as museum people do. But all of us share certain things. And so, I, to me, it would be, it would artificially disrupt the collection if we said, we don't want your damn t-shirts. Mm -hmm. Because this is an important way you communicate, or your buttons, or, uh, you know, we're working now with some people in, in music, and I don't want to get more specific than that until it's a little bit further along the way, but there are a group of people who uh, represent a certain ask area in music where social change is a very important thing, and you know, they have LPs, they have tapes and CDs, they have guitars, they have posters, all this, all the way across. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we, we will take it all, because this is the way they think, the way they operate. There are people, Mike Zinman's been collecting, he's always looking for a collection, but for years he's been buying from street people their signs and their artwork. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, what else has not collected? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but, I, know, I, wondered, I, I, thought, I thought of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's, it, that kind of thing is, I, you know, I, I don't know if it was Zinman who put me on to thinking this way, or John Dan and just spends, but uh, I do think there's a real value in thinking comprehensively about who these people are and how they communicate how they operate, how, what makes a movement happen, and what makes communication with the movement real. And so social media is the new intrusion into that, and we've got to figure out a way to accommodate that. Everything else, websites, we can do all those sorts of things pretty easily. Uh, but there are a few new things that are going to be more difficult, and the large things are more difficult in the old sense. Is there anybody other than the NSA or somebody like that that's recording everything that's on the internet? Uh, you know, they, every once in a while you read about someone trying to do massive swaths of 
you know, taking all of Facebook for a period of time or all of Twitter for a period of time or all of NSA. And I, I suspect there are places that are doing very large parts of it. Um, you know, as a historian, I, I look at it and say, you know, if I, if I archive every tweet ever, I would be very sad. Uh, you know, it, it's just an entity on an entity. But that's, that's me. I think there is somebody who's probably thinking uh, uh, on a way of looking at that set of communications through that medium and thinking about what it says about culture as a whole. And even though the individual tweets are incredibly inane, the totality of it and the way people communicate and what gets tweeted and retweeted and sent around does say something that's more profound. And so, yeah, there are organizations that are trying to do that. Uh, we have not thought about trying to do that. Yeah. I think it's, it's, a, it's a big project that requires a lot of computational muscle and a lot of people, I would think, as well. Rob, could you say that um, the thrust of special collections has a great interest in the material culture, where wherever the word is represented, uh, but it's not uh, done on paper, in other yeah. words, you, you will look at that and, and it sounds like you're actively collecting it in, in that way. I think that's a really good way of putting it. I, you know, the, if you look at special collections websites, including ours, you go and you see, you'll, there'll be a tab there somewhere that'll say collections, and you'll look at it and it'll say books, manuscripts, photos, archives. I thought about erasing that and just saying collections, because I don't see a distinction between talking about visual documents versus textual documents versus material culture. It's all the same to me. And I, I, the, the distinction is entirely artificial. Uh, my work on spiritualism, I'm, I'm just as happy to find a spirit slate as I am to find, uh, of which we have a couple downstairs, uh, as I am to find letters or minutes of meetings or whatever else there might be. And all of those, in traditional sense, end up in different departments. So we've begun to reorganize ourselves downstairs where our archivists are archivists, and we have what I call portfolios. So one guy keeps his eye on digital first, but everybody does digital work. One person, you know, I guess it would be me, keeps an eye primarily on photos, but everybody does photos, and so on. And I, I think that's a more, it, it's, a, it's a way that, that looks at the way people actually operate in the world. Holistic a little bit more holistically and a little bit more meaningfully to, to the way those things are created and consumed. So I, that's, that's what we typically try to do here. And you know, we fall short plenty of times, but as I say, keep your standards low enough, you'll never be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> Since you have put things in off-site, you have 26 floors, mm -hmm. you have staff. The tracking is, uh, many years ago, I developed, actually at the Clements Library, I developed a database that I used, the Clements had an accessions log, all done by hand, from 1927 or whatever, by hand, 1922, by hand, and uh, that wasn't doing it for me, so I, I created a database that uh, I've carried with me as I've gone along. and. Uh, We've recreated it when I got here. The database has two parts, one of which just is accession information, the other which is collection information. And we've actually now developed it to a point where it's standards compliant, uh, if you're an archivist, that matters. And it also has uh, indication of where things are shelved. So it will say, it will give you a number, an alphanumeric numeric sequence, which says if you go on floor 24, shelf one or aisle 109, shelf three, four, five, whatever, here's the stuff, tell you how many boxes are there. It's a constant fight against entropy, <laughs> and uh, everyone's always feeling that they've lost something or someone has made a mistake. We have students who are part of the process of reshelving, which means mistakes are in fact made. Uh, but, well, yeah. <laughs> but, but keeping after it, we've, we've done it pretty well, and uh, we've never really lost anything in the time I've been here. Uh, we've misplaced things, but found them. Um, I found this at the Clement section. We had every folder in the Henry Clinton papers numbered, you know, box one, number one, two, three, four, five. And when I was new there, I remember uh, a researcher coming up and says, item 93 is missing. And I thought, oh my God, what am I going to do? You know, it's like my third day on the job. 
And uh, I wrote it down very dutifully. And then the next day he came back and says, there's another folder missing. And uh, I got very concerned. And I, I did a search up and down. Uh, we looked all around the place. And ultimately I went downstairs and somebody who'd been there for a long time said, look at the microfilm. And they were just mistakes in memory. They didn't exist. Mm -hmm. oh. So that kind of thing happens. But what we try to do is build the system so that they're as flexible as we can and just keep after it all the time. Danielle, who works here, is actually organized. I, if you've seen my office, I'm not. Uh, but you know, we can build the database, and the database helps. Anything else? If not, I'll look forward to talking to any of you guys again. Uh, I'm downstairs, and uh, we'll um, you know have have a good uh, meeting. And if you have any questions, just give me a call. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.